Hello and welcome to the Global Health Matters podcast. I'm your host, Gary Aslanian. Increasingly, we've all been experiencing the effects of climate change. Most climate change predictions show an upward trend in temperature for at least the next nine decades. On average, global temperature is expected to rise by up to three degrees in Africa by the year 2050. Climate change is as much of a local issue as it is a global issue and requires collaboration of various stakeholders such as governments, NGOs, and scientific community. Rural communities whose health and livelihoods depend more directly on the environment have a greater vulnerability to these effects. Climate change has caused these communities to also be increasingly affected by neglected tropical diseases. These challenges are pushing researchers to identify and develop adaptive strategies in response to climate change and the associated burden of disease. For this episode, I had the privilege to speak to Paul Guakis a few weeks ago, who shared with me his rich experiences in working with the Maasai communities in Tanzania. Today, I'm speaking with my colleague Pierre to reflect on the valuable points Paul raised. Pierre is the program officer at the Chemical and Health Branch of the United Nations Environment Program. Hi, Pierre. Thank you for joining me today. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be with you, Gary. To start off, Pierre, you've had a very interesting career from studying political sciences and business management to journalism, and now you're working with UNEP. Could you maybe tell me how did your early experiences shaped or informed your career? Well, you know, I originated from uh, French Alps and and so very early on uh, being confronted and living as close as possible to our wonderful mountain, um, the, the, their challenge to climb them and their magnificent beauty. And I think that that has probably uh, led me to take the environment very seriously uh, early on. Uh, but I must say that uh, that also the, the, the link to, to policy, uh, my father having been always involved in associations, sports associations and so on, and the capacity to live together and uh, within, a, within a, a policy that makes sense to each and everyone. That is something also that has convinced me perhaps to, to take this long road of environmental policy development. Great, thanks. Uh, we're ready to hear from Paul. To give our audience some background on Paul, Dr. Paul Guakisa is a professor of immunology in Sakona University of Agriculture in Tanzania. He leads a research group in the Genome Science Center whose interest is on vector-borne diseases. His over 30 years of experience researching have contributed to better understanding of the relationship between people, livestock, and rural livelihoods. Our project base is the Maasai Steppe in Northern Tanzania. This is south of Kenya in East Africa. This is a home to pastoralist Maasai people who live far from urban areas and usually with large heads of cattle and usually close to wildlife areas. Now the area, the Maasai Steppe, I mean, is a large grassland area with unpredicted rains and long dry seasons that lead to long droughts. So the droughts, as well as the ecology of the area and the culture of the Maasai people prompt seasonal movements of the people with their livestock in search for water and pasture. In doing so, this pushes them to encroach into protected areas close to wildlife where they encounter disease vectors, including sissy flies that transmit trypanosomiasis. Hence, the people become vulnerable to these diseases. Now, the first major effect of climate change, therefore, is drought and frequent movements, or call it pastoralism. The droughts affect livelihoods, food security, as well as human and animal health. Secondly, I would say that climate change in the communities where we work causes a combination of health effects through emergence 
and re-emergence of diseases. Recently, we see re-emergence of diseases which were previously controlled or eradicated. Due to climate change, diseases are now reported in new ecological areas where they never occurred before. But also prevalence of some diseases has increased. For example, uh, a cattle disease called foot and mouth disease, previously occurred once a year, but now the disease occur, may occur two or three times per year. The third effect of climate change on uh, the health of animals and humans, I'll put it like uh, due to increased daily temperature and erratic rainfall, the land supports growth of alien invasive plants, which are poisonous to livestock. Uh, such invasive plant species are a big problem in some parts of the Maasai steppe and influence quantity and quality of pasture, thus affecting livestock productivity and susceptibility to opportunistic diseases. In the long term, this sums up to insecurity at household levels. And lastly, competition for land use, or I would call it human-human or human-animal conflicts. Climate change causes this. An example of human-human uh, uh, -human conflicts would be in terms of a competition for land use, like uh, between crop farmers and livestock keepers. But an example of a human-animal conflicts would be when humans encroach into wildlife areas. And such conflicts over years increase human displacement and poverty. So we just heard from uh, Prof. Um, Paul Guakisa, and clearly the lives of Maasai people in northern Tanzania have significantly been um, affected by climate change. Yes, definitely, and 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 Paul is uh, has provided us with a with a perfect, uh, com most comprehensive description of how climate change and human activities, in fact, has impacted every corner of our ecosystem. And climate change, as a result of these uh, human activities, uh, puts the health and the well-being of billions of peoples at increased risks. We can characterize, as uh, Paul has characterized, all the risks affecting his populations, but all population all around the world are affected by direct risks uh, related to climate change. These direct risks are extreme weather events, floods, uh, droughts, uh, wildfires. We've seen them in, 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 in uh, Australia. We've seen the recent drought affecting one of the most, uh, uh, one of the richest country in the world, uh, Germany, with most capacity to address these these increased risks, and and more than 130 people died uh, out of sudden flood um, in 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 their country. That's for the direct effect of climate change, but when we look at the indirect effect of climate change, these are important on securing our food and water. Uh, security, as well as all the spread of uh, climate-sensitive infectious diseases, as described so well uh, by uh, by Paul in in his uh, in his description of increased risk affecting its his population. So, what you talked about is really something that you probably have seen in 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 plenty of examples from other places or other other examples in in the region let's say in this case of course it's in africa but in as you mentioned in other places so this really is one example of many huh? but what is important is that if we can say that uh, that climate change uh, affects everyone we could say yes but it affects also some more is that there is a certain uh, uh, injustice in 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 this uh, climate change uh, and and their effect. Uh -huh. uh, if most of the greenhouse gases that are responsible for uh, the, the the effect of this climate change originate from wealthy countries, we could say that uh, their biggest impact, the, the 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 health impact, they impact more most of developing countries and mostly vulnerable populations. Uh, they impact more the small island developing states with the, the, the sea level rise, 
let me remind you that most of our cities and urban development occurs within 60 kilometers of the coastal uh, of the coastal line. Uh, we are putting our people more, most at risk in this the polar regions. Clearly, so many different things are involved here, and you work for the environment program. Um, what do you do around this? Like, how do you approach this? It sounds so overwhelmingly sort of challenging and so big. How how do you approach this? But, you know, in the past, uh, we thought that strengthening our environmental ministries, bringing the environmental wo fo uh, the environmental voice forward, building our scientific capacity to understand these environmental threats uh, was extremely important, and that regulations could be negotiated and that we could build conventions. Uh, and regulating most of these uh, threats and convincing our decision makers that engaging and committing to these uh, various conventions uh, is possible and would be uh, the best way. Despite all these efforts and some progress, the challenges remain immense, as you just said. Um, and so it is now more and more through integrated approach and integrated policy and tools bringing together various experts and various sectors, such as the health, the environment, how can we work together in a more uh, integrated manner? This is the focus of our uh, policies and the development of these policies uh, these days. You mentioned something uh, in, in advance of this um, discussion about a plan that was developed uh, in Africa for health and environment ministries. Remind me again, what was that? Uh, that's uh, probably the Libreville declarations that you're referring to and which I had the, the, the greatest pleasure and honor to, to contribute to, to, to its initiations, development and implementations. Um, and and that, that was a very important event in, in uh, giving uh, and providing and making the best out of the African leadership in promoting an integrated approach. Uh, when ministers of environment and ministers of health gathered at Libreville in 2008, they recognized that individual actions would not be enough, that we needed a global action, is that whatever the efforts of Paul or whatever the efforts of the most determined Maasai cannot do anything in pushing back the threats uh, due to climate change. When you say integrated, you mean between health and environment? Between health and environment, but that individual actions, whatever the, the, their importance, and they remain very important, but you need a global commitment, you need a common effort, you need, uh, you cannot co combat, battle all these effects of climate change by yourself. So when, when these health and environment ministers gather, first they recognize that at the regional level, we could make an important contribution to the common objectives at the global at the global level, um, and that they could that they could take a leadership toward a transformative uh, change, transformative actions at the continental uh, level. Uh, they they realize that if health and environment sectors work together. On uh, on a strat within a strategic of, uh, uh, alliance, they realized that the value of environment and health could be brought forward and to the highest of the policy decision makers working on economy and development framework, because that was important to change this economic and development framework. So that that is very important. That created an unprecedented intersectoral dialogue in between the health and environment sector. So how do these ministers of health and environment hear from people like Paul? When, when, we, when we gather uh, in Libreville, when we gather again in uh, Luanda, and again in Libreville in 2018, most of the community uh, and their, their, um, their um, uh, experience uh, was also um, uh, com communicated uh, to, 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 to the ministers. The ministers themselves have all along these 10 years of intersectoral dialogue uh, at, at their level also came up after having consulted their communities and 
strengthening uh, the message uh, and uh, the importance of involving the community and of developing also policies that would be uh, relevant to these communities. So what Paul is doing really is a very interesting and very much needed because basically he provides the evidence to policymakers to build their thinking as they discuss these things. Let's hear a bit more from Paul as he explains the relationship that Maasai people have had with environment and how diseases such as sleeping sickness are emerging as a new threat again. To understand the lives of the Maasai people and how climate change has influenced them, one has first to appreciate that the lifestyle of Maasai people is completely intertwined with the welfare, or rather the health of their cattle. Cattle are central in Maasai livelihood. We also say cattle are the lifeblood of the Maasai people because they serve as source of income, food, as well as security. So climate change directly influences livelihood of Maasai people because it affects livestock grazing patterns, nutritional status, and health of their cattle. So the socio-ecological and environmental factors force the people and their cattle to take pastoralism not as an option, but rather as a coping strategy for sustainable livelihood. In Maasai culture and Maasai lifestyle, seasonal migrations are very common. And these have important traditional values. A, in terms of preservation of pasture resources, allowing the pastures to recover between seasons. But also uh, the seasonal migrations have a traditional value in terms of avoidance of disease infested pastures, which are usually shared with the wildlife. Uh, working with the Maasai people, I got to learn from the Maasai elders that they describe their relationship with the environment being quite delicate and it is guided by ecological landmarks, such as specific trees or permanent water sources or grassland pastures or other resources on which their livelihood depends. You may be surprised to hear this, but some sites in Maasai communities are conserved as sacred sites based on historical narratives and are protected by community laws and norms. There are Maasai taboos and bad omens related to destroying such resources. It, this is so strong that decision-making at family or community level many times is embedded in the relations between society and environment. And these are protected by unwritten cultural laws, which are invisible to an outsider unless you have been trusted and welcomed into their daily life. So in brief, to give you a picture of the Maasai culture and the Maasai life, the Maasai people have kept their culture over centuries and regardless of an individual's level of education or wealth, their daily lifestyle, habits and choices are strongly adhered to culture. For a number of years, our research in the Maasai step focused on the disease called the African trypanosomiasis. This is a zoonotic disease meaning it's a disease which is transmitted uh, from animals to humans. And in humans, the same disease is known as sleeping sickness. This disease in humans affects close to 6 million people in Eastern Southern Africa. Now, in Tanzania, sleeping sickness used to be highly prevalent in the Maasai step, like 20, 30 years ago. However, due to effective prevention strategies, sleeping sickness is no longer perceived as a major public health problem among pastoralist communities now. 
and hence the disease has been listed as neglected. However, we as researchers know that changes of climate and changes of land use threaten to trigger re-emergence of this disease. So our focus was and remains to use multi-sectoral and transdisciplinary approaches to understand how changes of climate and changes of land use influence the social life of the Maasai people and their adaptation to sleeping sickness. As I said before, this disease is zoonotic. It affects animals as well, cattle in particular. So the disease can affect up to 90% of a cattle herd where it causes abortion, infertility, significant drop in milk production, as well as death, and hence causing reduced household income. And I told you before that uh, cattle are central in Maasai livelihood. So uh, Pierre, um, when talking to Paul, uh, it's clear that there are some other important uh, aspects of addressing climate change and really the relationship with the environment is influenced uh, by culture, religion. Um, we already talked about how some of the research done by Paul and his colleagues gets to that discussion uh, of policymakers. How do these other aspects get discussed? Um, how does that happen? Not enough, I would say, uh, my dear Gary. Uh, it is extremely important. You, you know, we, we devoted, uh, dedicated a, a lot of time in understanding the ecosystem services, the biodiversity, the climate change, um, uh, the, the pollutions, um, the, the, all these planetary crises. Uh, but the causes of it and, and understanding the cultural diversity and the history and the potential contribution of indigenous people, who we have to recognize that they have lived the longest on this planet without having extincted one single species. They know how to manage their resources in a sustainable manner. And, and, and that's actually exactly what our dear Paul is saying. Um, uh, he is saying that, that they know how to manage and they know how to respect their resources because they know that if they manage their resources well, they will be rewarded by the resources. Uh, if they poorly manage the resources, environment will strike back and much more violently than anybody in their community could do. So th this, is, this is a knowledge that is poorly captured uh, so far. And there is an ethical, moral, spiritual, and cultural contribution to be made uh, on, this, uh, on, on, on our challenges to, to achieve sustainability. And so far, it, it has been, you know, not neglected, but poorly addressed. Um, we, 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 we should have perhaps a... a um, a summit uh, to, on, the, on the spirit, perhaps, of sustainable development uh, that could bring um, our most experienced uh, people, and particularly indigenous people, and their contribution in, in uh, helping us to track the roads uh, of sustainability. This is a very important, uh, important aspect, and it is wonderful to hear a, a top-level scientist such as Paul recognizing the importance of local knowledge and how we could bridge this local knowledge with our, the best of our science today. But we need to do more at our health level, within our health sectors, within the environment sectors, when we do these uh, integrated policies, how to bring the capacity, the scientific capacity of these indigenous uh, people um, to recognize their traditional knowledge, to bridge um, their traditional knowledge with the best of our science and scientists uh, today uh, in addressing, in better understanding climate change, its impact, its origin, 
um, biodiversity impact, the link, the links with uh, zoonotic diseases, uh, how do, to prevent emergence or re-emergence of these uh, pathogens. Uh, this is extremely important, and and I, I think building the capacity of indigenous people while recognizing theirs. Uh, would be uh, would be uh, extremely important uh, in the future. We have to convince our um, decision makers uh, within our respective uh, programs, uh, WHO, uh, UNEP, um, that there is a need to fund um, this um, uh, strengthening of capacity of indigenous and local people if we want to have very effective alert systems and uh, preparedness uh, policies uh, in the future to prevent very costly new diseases that are affecting the entire world. And perhaps the COVID-19 the, the, the COVID is, is one very good example of what will happen to us if we are not able to mobilize local communities and traditional knowledge very early on in our chain of decision making, I would say. I agree, Pierre. Mobilizing local communities and using their knowledge is fundamental in helping us face these challenges. We have seen through the work that TDR supports how engaging various sectors and communities is key in dealing with the re-emerging zoonotic diseases. You're so right, uh, Gary. But uh, but you know this is this is very uh, very challenging. It seems very obvious. Uh, from our expertise and when we listen uh, to, to uh, the description of Paul and, and uh, with his uh, community. And, uh, but, but we have been um, shaped uh, by, uh, very, by, by the expertise and, and living in ivory tower, being right, and we don't care whether we are right for the others or not because our scientific uh, community, very focused, um, uh, doesn't care and they will be the only one uh, that, that will um, uh, reward you. Um, so there is very little incentives to nourish uh, this, this cooperation, this uh, knowledge exchange. Uh, it's, it, culturally, it's, it's very poor. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be, to be improved there. Uh, because we are not lacking of, of, uh, of expertise. We are suffering from a lack of uh, expertise sharing, of knowledge sharing, in between experts, economists, uh, law experts, uh, in, re in regulations, um, um, scientific uh, assessment uh, experts, in health, in the environment. All these, we have to work much more closely together if we want to make uh, some major headways uh, in the future to tackle these zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases represent 75% of all infectious diseases. And our COVID is a zoonotic disease. Um, so, and, and, and we expect more and more of these, of these diseases. If we, don't have, if we don't have, if we are not equipped with the best preparedness, if we don't have the best early warning system uh, for that, we, we won't be able to tackle it. Let's hear a bit more from Paul about some of the solutions that they have developed in order to address sleeping sickness in the Maasai communities. So in order to support the Maasai community in dealing with this disease, we developed in a participatory manner three innovative solutions. First, we trained Maasai communities on appropriate vector control using pesticide impregnated traps and pyrethroid acaricides on livestock to reduce sesa fly burden. Secondly, over time, we used community engagement strategies for what we called eco-health partnerships, which bring together local authorities, uh, stakeholders from research and the government, but uh, most importantly, the community members themselves and drive the whole partnership. And thirdly, we developed an early warning system for decision making where cattle may be taken for grazing with Lord Sese burden, but with plenty of water and pasture. This was a smartphone based application linking data on satellite images for precipitation, temperature, and water bodies. 
with local environmental data on cesafly density, infection, and disease prevalence. So any community member, any pastoralist, as long as he has a smartphone, can make a prediction where to take his cattle for grazing. Extraordinary. What, what is it, what, Gary, as a discussion, what, what is in common in all, in all these measures and, and, and approaches that, uh, that our dear Paul took here? Is that they, they, they are all preventive. They are all along the, the, the prevention. There's none of curative here. He's not talking about vaccine. He's not talking about confinement. He is not. It's all about prevention. And when the public health wants to take it, its measures seriously, it has to talk about preventive actions. And when you talk about preventive actions, you have to consider your environment. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. And there's nothing better than this in order to protect world populations from deadly disease in the future. It starts at the local level with a preventive uh, policy. Now, the question is, how do you make this understood by decision uh, makers and funders? Because this, need, this costs money also. Uh, to build a, an early warning system at the local level, there's, there's many local populations. How do you mobilize them? How do you sustain the feeding of, of, of all this thing? This is very important. If I may, Gary, uh, out of a, as a, an outcome of our Libreville Declaration, we created the, 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 the CHEMOPS, Chemical Observatory, funded by the Global Environmental Fund. And, and, and this was to better, better predict, prevent, and reduce chemicals risks. What we wanted here is exactly what Paul is, 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 is doing. It's sharing the expertise between uh, health and environment uh, sectors to better understand what is the chemicals that are threatening mostly the populations, give a tool, what we call a vulnerability calculators, to determine which populations and which priority issues is MOTSAS at stake. So there is already this sharing of information between the two sectors and the other industrial and agricultural sectors and so on. And after, it is to use also this with another calculator to better evaluate the cost and benefits of the interventions to be taken in order to convince our decision makers that it makes sense to invest on preventive actions. It is just an example that is going exactly along the line as, as our poll. Pierre, you correctly point to the importance of both the health and environmental sectors collaborating. Let's hear from Paul again, who also emphasized the importance of multi-sectoral and transdisciplinary collaboration in realizing the One Health approach. The success of any research project depends very much on collaboration between all stakeholders. It is of very high importance that all stakeholders feel ownership of a project. And stakeholders mean the community members, the researchers, local government authorities, and all the way up to central government authorities. So over years, I have developed a triangular approach for implementation of my research projects, whereby project objectives are derived from communities, then solutions are engineered in the laboratory using multidisciplinary approaches. And finally, findings are shared and tested and disseminated back in communities. Such a triangular research implementation assures a strong local community participation, equity, social innovation, capacity building, and the sharing of best practices. Over the last five years or so, we knew that our research success depended much on our relationship with the Maasai people and trust building between them and us. So we took the local people not as study participants, 
but as partners in research. At the end, we wanted to co-create innovations with communities so that we can introduce culturally relevant solutions and apply a broad approach to health improvement in which vector-borne infections, trypanosomiasis inclusive, is reduced and the community resilience is enhanced. I see opportunities for future work and uh, as I said before, uh, we need to take into consideration uh, a transdisciplinary approach. Uh, research should not be just theoretical, but the research should be interventions, really. And that is how communities can be addressed so that problems that are really faced by communities can be researched upon. So research objectives should come from the communities and research solutions then should go back to the communities. Like this, we may be doing research for implementation and not just research for publications. Mm -hmm. So Pierre, when we talked to Paul, he really um, underlined this important aspect that not only what is being researched, but how it's being researched um, is super important. And also, I really love the way he described the need to co-create or blended approach to knowledge creation where you have the scientific and local approach and also allowing for bottom-up approach where the community informs what's happening in the process of research or understanding of the trends that are happening at the global level where you work. Um, uh, is there a way to harness that knowledge or these approaches and try to apply them in some of the strategies? How, how do you do that? First, what, what an insightful and, and visionary uh, experience and, and, and uh, testimony from, uh, from uh, and visionary statements from, uh, from our dear Paul again. What is important here in this techno blending and, and, and all of this uh, uh, possibility of intersectoral dialogue and, and, and to connect all these various stakeholders and, and identifying uh, problems to come back from the community, to come back with the solutions for the community. Um, this is really what needs to be done. And this was already a challenge to be done at the community level. And fortunately, our dear Paul and his community is showing us the way. I still have to say that we are far from this result at, at the global level. If you think about it, we still remain within forum of experts based on sectoral uh, forum. We have uh, our World Health Assembly, we have our um, United Nations Environment Assembly, we have the development uh, sectors, the agricultural sectors, the industrial sectors, but very rarely we have all these sectors working together uh, and identifying the problems together coming back together with the solutions, implementing, intervening together. Um, this remains because we are still expert at competing over limited resources uh, rather than cooperating in order to make a difference at the community level. And we have to admit that. We still have to, de to, to, to define some, some forum where research, we can have this techno blending to provide the best assessment as possible at the global level, as Paul is describing it. We still have to provide a forum to, um, uh, to provide an intersectoral dialogue between the health, the environment and the economic sectors. We still have to have a forum where um, a multi-sectoral um, um, engagement of the public sectors with the private sectors and uh, the, the civil uh, society can have really a negotiation process, identify who is responsible for what, and committing uh, and engaging uh, over a set of engagement. That's, that, that, that is still needed. 
is there anything done uh, to address that? No, we 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 try. You know, we we for example, in the, within uh, within uh, the, the, this um, um, regional forum uh, through the Libreville Declaration, where we facilitated for the first time this intersectoral dialogue between the ministers of health and the ministers of environment, and we uh, have reached. But it is still a battle, a struggle to convince all the donors, all the funders. Um, to recognize the value of this intersectoral dialogue. Uh, that, how much they, can it create in terms of, of research? How can it make our policy mo uh, more effective, less costly? Uh, all this needs to be uh, also um, uh, um, brought forward, I would say. We need to come up with results on the few examples that we've been able to, to develop um, with scientific evidence as well as economic evidence. Not all scientific, it's also how we can make the best of this scientific knowledge in translating this uh, scientific knowledge into economic types of arguments to convince these decision makers that there is, uh, there is a value in preventive health and in uh, working together between the health and environment as Paul is doing within his research field with uh, his Maasai uh, community. This is a concrete example that needs to be expanded at the, at the global level. There's still a lot to reflect, and most of our researchers can reflect on this, on how we could have negotiation processes in the future that can be more integrated, perhaps along the line of the Libreville Declaration. We will hear from Paul one last time as he shares his memorable moments from working with the Maasai communities and especially how much he was able to learn from working with them. Memorable moments working with Maasai communities. Uh, number one is uh, when you are outside the communities, you, 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 just don't, you just don't know enough about the people. You think that you are going into remote areas. Indeed, they are remote areas because there's no tap water, there's no electricity, uh, there are no flush toilets. Uh, so it's a, it's a difficult, it's a different lifestyle. But then uh, once you enter the community homes, then you start seeing the, uh, the, the human side of it all, that uh, these are pastoralists, but they live in certain areas where uh, they, they have a living and they have a lot of local knowledge and traditional knowledge, let me call it, that makes them survive under those conditions which I just described. For example, they eat a lot of meat, but they also eat other things which maybe in urban areas we don't, but surprisingly, they also use a lot of herbs which help them uh, to keep fit, to keep healthy in, in those environments. So for me, the memorable moments are to get to learn more about uh, the local practices uh, the local knowledge, uh, the local ways of uh, going around uh, things or issues like health, um, water, um, education, etc. When you sit close to Maasai elders, they like learning from you. But then as you want to talk, they also talk. And then you find yourself that you learn more from them. You want to tell them of problems which are academically defined, but they tell you solutions which are locally solved. So this needs a balance of mind to understand that it's not that we are going to teach or to get information, but, that, but rather we are going to, uh, to listen and to, uh, to enjoy not only the work, but also the social part, uh, the community life within the Maasai communities. Uh, they like giving gifts. Uh, they like roasting meat uh, on firewood so that they welcome you to their delicious uh, local meals, which is right in the bush, but very tasty. And I enjoyed doing some of these as well. Uh, one has to be there to testify that uh, Maasai culture 
is really a treasure that should not be lost. Thank you, thank you, Gary, for bringing forward uh, these uh, these important uh, reflections. Uh, it it is of of greatest value, uh, and I think uh, uh, history is being written when 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 you listen uh, to this, and it, it and it is coming really from um, from the heart. And um, a good scientist uh, needs to have also some uh, some emotion and and knows how to tell. And, and to relate um, for, for observing in, in, in a better manner, for understanding uh, some pattern. Um, I think uh, this is a very uh, vivid uh, witnessing of, of, um, of uh, and an experience of tremendous value. Our Paul said it, uh, said it very well. He said first uh, two, two, two things that strikes. Um, the, the notion of trust, very important when you want to, be, to interconnect uh, expertise. Um, but but also that local knowledge should not be lost. You know, in biodiversity, uh, within the biodiversity community, uh, when we try to to assess uh, what we are losing, we have a problem because we don't know what we have. So the first thing in biodiversity is already uh, to know what what you have before knowing understanding what you are losing. I would say it's a little bit the same with our uh, knowledge uh, and no local knowledge would be very important to uh, to take stock of all this uh, local knowledge uh, before uh, understanding that we may be uh, losing it. Um, so if that that's 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 a first effort that that really needs to be done. The the third thing that that I think is important from from Paul um, is. Is, it is, is this experience replicable everywhere? Is, is, uh, that there is an identity, that, that there is a diversity that needs to be recognized? And can we replicate uh, this, uh, this approach everywhere? And I must say that it is extremely challenging at the global level to achieve the, exactly the same thing. You know? How would you be able to bring uh, within one single environment, uh, the, the, host city or all this local knowledge um, uh, because they, they, they are so diverse and so numerous uh, that it might be difficult. Uh, but, but there is certainly some possibilities to represent most of them and, and, and to take stock of all, of, of all this knowledge. That is the task that is ahead of us and that we do hope that uh, with reflections on how to build integrated policy, we can move forward and perhaps achieve uh, the, the, our sustainable development goals as as early as possible. One one last word, perhaps, is uh, that I'd like through you to make sure that Paul will be invited in one of the big forum of uh, our environment, whether at uh, uh, in Libra within the Libreville Declaration context or in Nairobi, because I do think uh, and I'm convinced that uh, most of our environmental experts will be delighted and, and very inspired. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I want to thank you, our audience, for joining us today and remind you of the additional episode resources we have available on the Global Health Matters webpage. Here you will be able to review a video of Paul and his work with the Maasai communities. If you have liked this episode, don't forget to give us a five-star rating. Global Health Matters is produced by TDR, the special program for research and training in tropical diseases. Gary Aslanian, Lindy Van Niekerk and Maki Kitamura are the content producers and Obadiah George is the technical producer. This podcast was also made possible with the support of Chris Coase, Elisabetta Desi and Isa Suder Dayao. The goal of Global Health Matters is to provide a forum for sharing perspectives on key issues affecting global health research. Send us your comments and suggestions to tdrpod at who.int and be sure to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening.